Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, everybody, to, to be here. Uh, now we restart with uh, our uh, seminars, so the list of seminars, uh, with uh, Professor Richard Toll, with, uh, with his paper titled The Economic Impact of Climate and Weather. Uh, I remember that uh, this is uh, our list of seminars, which is uh, titled Economic Modeling Seminars. This, uh, uh, we started with uh, uh, Professor Pindike, uh, uh, Jeffrey Hill, and, uh, um, Jeff uh, and uh, Professor Svart in uh, um, December. Now we restart. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have here uh, Professor Richard Tord. I remember also the next uh, uh, seminars. So the, sec uh, the, the next will be on February, uh, 8th February, uh, with uh, Professor Bergman. After, on the right of this, we can see that we will have uh, also Professor Gollier on February again, 18. Uh, Professor Van der Prog and uh, on March. After again on the right, we have uh, we will have uh, Professor Gerlag, and finally uh, Professor Kunduri. Uh, the, I remember that the, this economic modeling seminar is uh, uh, organized by Italian Association of Environmental Resource Economists, with the University of Brescia and the Fondazione Enrico Mattei FIM, and uh, with the collaboration of uh, European University Institute and the University of Siena, University of Siena, and the Department for Environmental Science and Policy of University of Milan. The idea is of this list of seminars is a, a pathway in which we are uh, looking at uh, seminars of uh, some talks from the most important economists on political economy in uh, special energy and environment uh, on uh, uh, uncertainty and uh, social uh, welfare. Uh, this pathway will uh, converge to uh, the road to uh, Yare 2021, that is our next uh, conference, which will be held in uh, uh, April uh, 21 and 23rd. I remember that uh, we have a deadline for uh, um, the, the paper, submission of the paper, and it will be 29th of January of this month. So I, I remember to to, uh, to send your paper. At the end, during uh, the, um, the, this uh, um, conference, uh, the uh, keynote speaker will be uh, Professor uh, Robert Pindike and Professor um, um, William Nordhaus. Uh, we're waiting for a confirmation, but uh, at the end, at the moment, we have a confirmation that, that we will be sure about this on February. Now we start today, and it's a pleasure to have here uh, Professor Richard Toll. Now I give you a, a very quick presentation after I leave the floor to Professor uh, Toll. Professor uh, Richard Torre is a professor of the Department of Economics, University of Sussex. is also professor of Economics of Climate Change Institute for Environmental Studies in the Department of Special Economics in Amsterdam. Uh, about his uh, research topics is uh, are, um, environmental economics and climate, economics of energy, economics of theorems and scientometrics. About uh, his uh, research, uh, I, uh, there is a very long list uh, of uh, papers, uh, more than uh, 200 publications. Among these, so it's a very long, so I, I, I choose, uh, I've chosen uh, one, uh, some of these. So we have American Economy Review, Journal Economy Perspective, Journal Economy Dynamics Control, Climate Change, Science, uh, Environmental Resource Economics, uh, Energy Economics, Energy Journal, Ecological Economics, and so on. So the, as I told you, the list is very, very long. Uh, among his books, uh, we have uh, uh, books uh, about uh, economic analysis of uh, land using global climate um, change policy, environmental crisis, and uh, climate economics. Uh, Richard, Toll, Professor Richard Toll is uh, ranked among the top 150 economists in the world, and uh, in a specific uh, uh, ranking that is a ranking uh, of the uh, according to the um, most influential authors about uh, environmental economics and energy economics is uh, in the top. I have to say that is also the fourth number in uh, in uh, energy economics according to ideas uh, um, uh, ranking. Honestly, words about this. Uh, Richard Toll is uh, author of uh, working group one, two, three, and of the intergovernmental panel of climate change. Shared winner of the Nobel Prize, um, Peace Prize uh, for 2007, author and editor of a UNEP uh, handbook of method and climate ch uh, change impacts like assessment uh, and uh, adaptation strategies, GITA uh, research fellows, member of Academy of Europe, and uh, also uh, now is involved in the European Climate Forum, uh, European Forum Integrated Ass um, Environmental Assessment and uh, Energy Modeling Forum. As you can see, it's a, it's a very pleasure to have here uh, Professor Richard Torr, which is, a, is a, one of the most important. Um, professor, and the word about, especially about environmental economics. Uh, 
And so now I leave the floor to him, and uh, I think it will be very, very interesting to uh, listen to him about the, this paper, that is uh, the economic impact of climate and weather. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. After an introduction uh, like that, I can only uh, disappoint. Uh, I have to apologize for my slightly unprofessional or completely unprofessional background. I know the schools in England are closed, um, and that means that I've been kicked out of my office. Um, I think you, my uh, home office. Um, uh, my son has now occupied that one. I'm going to talk today um, and I'm going to present an empirical paper uh, that we've been working on for a couple of years now called Weather, Climate uh, and uh, the Economy. And it's almost done, uh, but still I would appreciate uh, your feedback. If you want to interrupt me in the meantime, uh, that is perfectly fine. Uh, weather, Climate and the Economy. I'm beginning uh, with a for this audience, uh, perhaps a peculiar uh, remark, and that is that climate matters. Climate matters to the economy. Uh, if this were not the case, then we would not worry about climate change. And I presume that most people in the audience do worry about climate change. Uh, but when I say that climate matters, I do not mean what the old people used to think. This is not the same as climate determinism. There's, of course, a very long uh, tradition uh, in academia about climate determinism, uh, starting with Guangzhou, uh, Hippocrates, Aristotle, even Khaldun, uh, and all those people really believed that geography and climate were destiny, yeah, the character of a people, and therefore its eventual political success and its economic success, success was determined solely by the prevailing environmental uh, conditions. Um, more recent writers, still you could see things like this. Uh, Jerry Diamond, uh, for instance, is pretty strong in his uh, environmental determinism. Uh, Alfred Huntington, uh, a century before that, uh, so that was the turn of the 20th century, was also a pretty strong environmental determinist, although he, of course, also introduced a good bit of racism uh, into uh, the story. But that is not what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to say, well, climate is the be all and end all of development. But still, it needs to be said that climate matters, because if you read through your mainstream economics, then you will actually find that most macroeconomists, people who are interested in the uh, pattern of income across the world or in long-term uh, economic growth, many of them, if not most of them, would argue that climate is irrelevant. Um, and Danny Roderick has a paper that says that institutions rule, and Bill Easterly has a paper that essentially draws the same conclusion, that the only thing that matters to humans are the only thing that can explain patterns of development are institution. The only thing that matters to humans are other humans. Um, now, in another famous paper, Ajemo uh, uh, and later on Marcella Alson uh, sort of qualify this by saying, well, climate may have shaped and geography may have shaped those institutions, but after that process was finished, it's only institutions that matter. So climate mattered in the past, in the distant past. Uh, Jemolu, it's around the, the year 1500. Uh, Alzan is a bit more recent. He works, uh, Jemolu works through uh, malaria. Alzan works through the Cheche fly. It's a little bit more recent, but still climate stopped mattering three, four, five hundred years ago. Now, if this is true, then in the very long run, we need not worry about climate change because the only thing that determines the pattern of income and how rich we are uh, and how fast we grow are institutional factors. And it may be that climate change sort of pushes us out of an equilibrium, but in the very long run, the effect of climate change will disappear if you believe these papers. Um, so it needs to be said that climate matters when you talk outside of uh, the discipline of environmental economics. Um, but climate obviously matters for such things as agriculture. 
it obviously matters for such things as energy demands. It matters for tourism, where tourists want to go. It matters for health. It matters for uh, labor productivity. Um, but somehow in these empirical papers that I just referred to, that signal seems to get lost when you run the regressions on a country level. Now, when you run the same regressions on a finer scale, uh, then what you would find that climate explains in part uh, the income distribution within countries. Uh, Nordhaus was the first to show this, but there are more recent papers. Anderson uh, and Kalkul essentially show uh, the same thing. Uh, the problem with these papers and the problem with the paper uh, that I'm going to show today uh, is identification. It's very hard to argue that the effect of climate on income is causal. Uh, and the reason is that climate varies only very slowly over time and other things that are important for development also vary and typically vary much faster uh, over time. Climate varies much more strongly over space than it does over time. But again, there's many other potential explanations why uh, incomes may vary beside uh, the climate. So there is simply an issue of uh, confounding variables that Sort of bedevil any sort of cross-sectional study uh, of the impacts uh, of climate on uh, development. Uh, so what people have done, um, environmental economists have finally caught up with the causal revolution uh, in the rest of economics, and people have studied the impact of weather on the economy. And by now there is a long list of papers. Uh, the, the one that you see here is really uh, just a short, uh, a, a, an abstract of those papers. Um, the effect of weather on the economy is very well documented. From a perspective of identification, weather is great because if you look at the weather from the economy, from an economic perspective, then weather variations are random. Um, and therefore, it's essentially an experimental setup, and therefore your estimated effects are very easily identified. And that is what you see in all these papers that indeed they claim uh, to have found the cause of effect. I would not believe everything uh, I would read in these papers, uh, because by now the impact of weather on economic activity has been documented for so many things that we humans do, and for so many different sectors in so many different places. Uh, and of course, all these things interact with one another, so there may still be uh, a reason to doubt the claim of causality, but you cannot you cannot argue that weather does not affect the economy because it's by now been so very well documented. Um, there's also uh, a couple of papers, including one by myself, uh, but uh, the honor really goes to Melissa Dell. Um, is that weather shocks, weather shocks affect economic growth. Um, that is, if it's unusually hot, the economy grows more slowly, is a typical uh, finding. Uh, and by now there uh, is a bunch of papers that show that this is indeed uh, the case and the effect seems to be reasonably uh, robust. And um, there's two strands in this literature. Um, and that has to do with how you deal with heterogeneity. Uh, and what Melissa Dell and others have found is that these weather shocks uh, have a stronger effect on economic growth in poorer countries, but less so in rich countries. And um, whereas there's another strand of literature associated with Marshall Burke and colleagues uh, who argue that uh, weather shocks are more important, weather shocks are stronger in hotter uh, countries. Now, this is important. Uh, empirically, it is actually very hard to distinguish between hot countries and poor countries. There's only a few countries in your sample that are hot and rich. Singapore would be one uh, example, uh, or that are uh, cold and poor, and Mongolia would be one uh, example. But by and large, rich country, uh, hot countries are poor. Uh, and therefore, within sample, it is very hard to distinguish whether the heterogeneity has to do with poverty or whether it has to do with heat. 
uh, that is within sample. Out of sample, there is an enormous difference between these two specifications because the projections for the rest of this century are that the world will be hotter, climate change, but also richer. Uh, and if it's true that hotter countries are more vulnerable to weather shocks, then things very rapidly uh, get out of hand. Marshall Burke is right, and you project very large impacts of climate change. Whereas if it's the case that it's poorer countries that are more vulnerable to weather shocks, then of course in a richer world, the vulnerability to climate change would fall rather than rise. And you would get completely different projections of what the future uh, would look like. So this distinction, hard as it may be within sample, is very important for the story of climate change. Um, the uh, big problem with studies of the impact of weather on the economy is what you do with them in a situation of climatic change. And the simple assumption, and you would see that in too many papers, is that you estimate the impact of weather shocks on the economy and then assume that the same coefficients would hold for the impact of climate change on the economy. Um, but that would be incorrect uh, because, uh, as a meteorologist would tell you, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And the implication is that because weather is unpredictable more than five days uh, into the future, and um, the response to weather shocks is very limited. There's very little you can do. You can put up an umbrella when it rains, you can close the floodgates when it pours. But that is basically your range of adaptation options. Whereas if climate were to change, you can do much more because it's a slower process. It takes place over decades. You can buy an umbrella or you can build uh, those floodgates and you can do much more. In other words, um, the weather impact studies estimate a short run elasticity where everything is kept constant, particularly the capital stock and your technology and your institutions and your expectations, all of those are constant. Whereas if you're interested in the impact of climate change, all, all these things can change. You're interested in the long-term uh, elasticity. <clears throat> now there's uh, two papers out there that work out how much we can actually learn from the study of weather impacts about climate change. The first uh, paper uh, is by Dyer, De Yugena and Michang, um, still unpublished. Um, and they derive the impact of the conditions under which weather studies are informative about climate change. Uh, and I won't take you through all of them. Essentially, they are the same conditions under which a market leads to a Pareto optimum. So you need to assume perfect visibility, no externalities, no public goods, perfect information, full rationality, and so on and so forth. And, and those are fairly strict conditions that are very easily violated in real life. Um, there is another paper uh, by Derek Lemoyne that essentially tries to derive the same thing. And Derek notes that because a lot of the investments in adaptation are indeed investments, they invest in long-lived capital. It's not just that your current markets need to, your spot markets need to be perfect, but you also need to have perfect and complete future markets. Because essentially, if you're building a dike, or if you're building an irrigation reservoir or something like that, you do that for the future. So your expectations for the future need to be, not that, that your knowledge of today needs to be perfect, uh, as a unrealistic an assumption that is, but also your expectations of the future need to be perfect. Uh, and there's plenty uh, of evidence that people's knowledge of the weather uh, is less uh, than perfect and people's recollection and people's predictions of the weather are less than perfect. So I think it is safe to conclude that you cannot just take those weather impact estimates and apply them to uh, climatic change. There's also people who've done it the other way around. Uh, you see two papers listed here that they take um, um, not uh, weather 
impacts to climate, but it had climate impacts to weather, and that would be just as wrong. Uh, and some of these papers get published in good journals, as you can see, and they're simply wrong uh, in this regard. Um, so, what are we going to do in this particular paper? Uh, what I'm going to try and do is model the impact of climate and weather simultaneously. I'm going to try and reconcile, unite, well, <laughs> that's not what I'm going to do, but I'm going to try and reconcile the two strands of literature, the strand of literature that looks at the impact of climate change empirically and the strand of literature that looks at the impact of weather uh, empirically. Um, and the uh, basic thoughts uh, behind the paper are fairly simple, the technical details are not. Um, and that is the first, uh, the first idea is that climate affects the production potential. If you want to produce milk, then the best cow that you can get is a Holsteiner. And Holsteiners, as the name suggests, are from Holstein, which is the northern tip of Germany, the southern tip of Denmark. And those cows are happy in that climate. If you take them out of that fairly cool climate and put them, say, in uh, Thailand, they live, but they are very unhappy and they don't produce much milk. Unless, as you see uh, on these photos here, you actually cool the animals. This is not a picture from Thailand, this is from South Carolina, where indeed you see that these animals need to be cooled. Not air conditioning, but actually they are regularly sprayed to keep them cool. That is, maintains your milk production, but it is of course fairly expensive. Now, continuing with the example of Denmark, Denmark is very good if you want to uh, produce milk. If you want to grow rice in Denmark, you have a problem. There's plenty of water, but it's simply not hot enough. If you want to grow jasmine rice, which some people say is the best rice in the world, you need to go to Thailand. And so climate determines what you can do with your agriculture, as well as with a lot of other uh, economic activities. It essentially determines the potential production of your economy. It's not the sole determinant, uh, do not misunderstand me, but it is one of the determinants. Uh, weather is essentially lost potential. If you have a drought, you lose your crop. It does not mean that it was a bad idea to grow that crop there in the first place. It just means that you were unlucky. And um, or if you have not a drought, but a flood, and uh, your roads uh, are impassable and those sort of things, then what you have is a disruption of your transport. And if your buildings get flooded, you have a disruption of your production. It doesn't affect your potential of production, but it does affect your production in that particular year. It moves you essentially, your bad weather essentially makes that you cannot reach your potential. Now, if we put these two thoughts together, then essentially the empirical model, the empirical specification that you want to do is you want to put climate in the production frontier and you want weather as a source of inefficiency. And if you phrase it like that, you immediately recognize that I'm going to use stochastic frontier analysis. Uh, so the data that we're going to use is uh, a dependent variable is output per worker. Uh, we have data from some 160 countries uh, of about 65 years. Of course, not all countries uh, existed back in 1950, so it's uh, an unbalanced panel. Um, and then in the frontier of the model, we're going to put capital per worker. Obviously, we're interested in output per worker, so we need to control for the capital stock. And we're going to include the average rainfall and the average temperature. Uh, we used uh, the University of Delaware's graded data and then we aggregated this using uh, population weight. Um, and then in the inefficiency term, we're, gonna not, we're not going to put in climate, but we're going to put in weather, the deviation of temperature and rainfall from their long-term means, normalized by their long-run uh, standard deviation. Uh, so that is what we're going to do. Um, now, for those of you who are not familiar with stochastic frontier analysis, here is a brief overview. Essentially, the starting point is production efficiency, which you may recall from your introduction to micro. Uh, 
And that is, efficiency in production means that a company cannot rearrange its inputs so that it makes more outputs, right? Then we call that company to be efficient in production. Uh, production efficiency then implies a frontier. This is the best we can do given our endowments, right? Um, and of course, that frontier is not perfectly measured, right? We don't exactly observe the output of every company and we don't exactly observe how much they actually put in in terms of uh, commodities and intermediates. Uh, but we have, we measure these things uh, imperfectly. Um, then on top of that, the assumption is that not all, uh, not all firms are efficient efficient in production. There are inframarginal firms. Um, and if you believe economic theory, those firms should not exist. Uh, but of course, we never observe the economy in its equilibrium. If theory is right, then we observe the economy as it's moving towards an equilibrium. And the fact that we observe inframarginal companies, companies that are inefficient, um, means that either those companies are on their way to bankruptcy or they're on their way to cleaning up their act. That is essentially the underlying assumption uh, there. Now, these two things together imply that we have a composite error term. We have uh, an idiosyncratic error, essentially a measurement error, our uh, in, imperfect observations. Um, and we have a one-sided error that is essentially measures our inefficiency. Uh, and that looks uh, something as follows. The model that we're using is the true picked effect model developed by Bill Green. Um, and uh, what we have is that we have the frontier, so the log of per capita outputs is a function of uh, per capita capital, the third year average temperature and it's squared, uh, square term, um, the first year average rainfall and it's square, then a shared time trend, I'll come back to that, a uh, country dummy, then an idiosyncratic error, that is your standard assumptions, and an inefficiency term, U, and that U term is a stochastic variable, it is a half normal distribution, so we take the bell curve and throw away the half under the zero, and the negative half we throw away. Um, we set the location parameter to zero, uh, but we have a spread parameter, that's the sigma squared, and the sigma squared is a constant, a country-specific constant, um, plus the temperature anomaly, so this is the temperature in that year as a deviation from its long-term 30-year average, divided by 30-year standard deviation, and the same for rainfall. Now, even though we set the location parameter to zero, because it's a half normal rather than a normal, the expectation is actually not zero, but the expectation uh, is sigma, so the square root of this thing here, uh, times uh, the square root of two over pi, right? So that is the model that we're trying to estimate. Um, now, for those of you who have paid attention um, uh, and your econometrics, you know that this is a very nonlinear model. Um, computationally cumbersome, you can't get anywhere analytically, and uh, you have to solve it uh, with numerical methods, uh, but because the model is so nonlinear, this is a hard thing to do. Um, we used uh, Stator for this, particularly SF model, if you're not familiar with this, uh, Stator will lead you to SF Cross and SF Panel, uh, don't use that, use the uh, user uh, generated uh, procedures by Kumbakar um, that are known as asset model. Um, so that is what we did. Uh, it's still problematic, but at least it works. Uh, we ran a whole bunch of uh, robustness checks instead of the half normal. We used the exponential distribution instead of the absolute uh, anomalies. We looked at squared anomalies and asymmetric anomalies. Uh, we looked at different asymmetries. Um, and our main worry, and I'll talk about it at length, is non-stationarity. Uh, so what did we find? Uh, well, here is our base uh, specification. Uh, the dependent variable we call is the log of per capita income. 
uh, capital is highly significant, uh, significant temperature and temperature square pop up, rainfall does not pop up. When we interact temperature uh, with uh, a, a dummy for poverty, uh, that pops up as significant, but again, not for rainfall. Um, and we also see a lot of significant terms in the efficiency part of the model. Now, I ran through this very quickly. Don't worry, I'm now going to go through the uh, salient parts more slowly. Uh, so, what do we find in the frontier? Well, essentially, what we find is a, a, a parabola. That is, if you're in the optimum, you're fine. Uh, but if it's too hot or too cold, you're not so fine. Uh, but that particular response is differentiated by uh, wealth. In uh, rich countries, you find a fairly shallow uh, parabola. That is, you're fine if you're in the optimum. If you're far away from the optimum, actually not that bad off. Um, but the parabola is much steeper, that's the red curve, if you're in a poor country. The optimum is higher, but more importantly, the relationship is much uh, steeper. Uh, so this is the first thing that we find. Uh, the second thing that we find is that rainfall doesn't pop up. This is in line with previous literature. Uh, it still sort of defies uh, explanation, but uh, this is what basically all these papers find. Um, and uh, this relationship that you see here, the red curve and the green curve, is essentially robust to uh, our specification. Uh, so that is what you see here. Uh, in the top panel, you see the linear effect uh, of temperature. And in the bottom panel, you see uh, the squared effect of temperature. And then this is the implied uh, optimum uh, temperature, uh, which is, of course, the linear effect over two times the squared effect with a minus sign. right? Um, and what you see is that it doesn't really matter. Those things uh, don't change. That is true in our base specification that I just showed. If we uh, omit the interactions, um, if we omit the interactions in the inefficiency term, uh, if we include instead of a poverty dummy, a heat dummy, if we switch to the exponential uh, inefficiency term, if we exclude rain, if we use squared anomalies in the inefficiency term or linear ones or asymmetric ones, Basically, nothing changes. The only effect, uh, the only sort of, if you can call it fragility in our results, is if we change the definition of what is poor. In our base case, we declare countries to be poor if they're below the sample median. In the alternative specification, we say you're poor if the World Bank says you're poor. Um, and now, because the rich countries and poor countries have a different response function. If you start moving observations from the red curve to the green curve, then yes, those curves will start to change, right? Uh, so this is no surprise uh, that this particular result is not uh, robust to this. And this, this, by the way, is the optimum for the rich countries, uh, I should have said. <clears throat> but this part of the specification seems uh, perfectly fine. Now, the main concern is, of course, but you're not going to do, you said you were not going to do climate determinism, and the only explanatory variable in your frontier is the climate, right? Uh, so, what are you at? Um, we re ran the regression now with capital per worker uh, in there, so our continuous interaction rather than the dummy doesn't change the results, uh, and then we included an institutional variable. The problem with the literature that argues that institutions rule is that these institutional explanatory variables are only available for recent years, for 10, 15 years into the past. Our panel, recall, starts in 1950. So we don't have such things as voice and accountability and uh, rule of law and all those things for this large number of countries going uh, 70 years into the past. And um, what this institutional literature will also tell you is that democracy or the form of government is a highly correlates with all the institutional quality indicators. What we did was we included quality four that essentially tells you whether a country is autocratic or democratic. Um, and we included that, does not change our results. 
Uh, we then interact the quality four with uh, our climate variables, and that is the result that you see here in the middle. Uh, and what you see is no, this also does not differentiate uh, between countries. It's not the case uh, that autocratic countries, here shown in um, gray, have a different response function to the climate than democratic countries, here shown in blue. And then anocratic are somewhere in between, anocracies are somewhere in between autocracies and democracies. Um, so that seems to be uh, fairly robust. So we're happy uh, with this. Now let's look at the inefficiency term. What do we find? Um, the temperature anomaly in rich countries doesn't matter, but in poor countries it does. The uh, rainfall anomaly in poor countries uh, matters, and in rich countries it matters uh, as well, but has an opposite sign. Um, then we included uh, uh, poverty for heat. Essentially, are you above the median uh, temperature in the sample? And you see that A, those parameters do not appear to be significant. Uh, and second, actually, the parameters for the rest of the model are not affected by its inclusion. So this is a pretty robust result. Now, recall that what we're modeling here is inefficiency. So essentially, uh, what this parameter says is that if it's abnormally hot or abnormally cold, then you're more inefficient. That is, you're further away from your potential, that is, you're poorer in that particular year. Or if it's abnormally dry or abnormally wet, then you're further from your potential, you're poorer than you could be, right? Uh, so these parameters, these signs of these parameters make perfect sense. This one here um, is a bit of a puzzle. Um, um, and we could not really explain it, but uh, one explanation for floods is that our data are of gross domestic product rather than of net domestic product. And that means that we suffer from Basquiat's uh, broken window fallacy. That is, our data measure not if, it's, if there's a flood and all your buildings get damaged, that is not included. Uh, in our measure, but the repairs of those buildings is included. And that, of course, leads to uh, greater economic growth when measured uh, uh, as GDP. Uh, so that may explain what is going on. There may be issues with the drought and inflation in agriculture. Um, that may explain it, but it is, it is puzzling. It is not puzzling that if it, this is the explanation, if this is a broken uh, windows policy, that it shows up in rich countries and not in poor countries, because the repairs that you see after uh, after natural disasters are much much faster in rich countries than they are in poor countries. Typically within uh, days and weeks, whereas in poor countries, if it happens at all, it may be months and years before the repair uh, before the repairs take place. Um, so that may explain what is going on. Now. I promised you that I would talk about non-stationarity, uh, and this is our main concern in this paper. Um, the dependent variable uh, per capita income is non-stationary, and of course, our uh, variables of interest, climate, is also non-stationary, right? That's climate change. Uh, that means that you have non-stationary weather. Um, the error terms are both assumed to be stationary. Actually, not clear uh, to us whether the assumption, the, the, strictly the assumption is that both should be stationary, but perhaps they should just be stationary uh, together. That is a bit unclear. Um, now, this is an issue. Uh, one worry is that the co integration tests that you would find in the literature are not designed for models like this. There are simply no co-integration tests or stationarity tests for stochastic frontiers uh, models, let alone for panel uh, stochastic frontier models. Um, we had discussions uh, with this about this with Bill Green, and he said, yeah, I would worry. Uh, we also had a discussion with this about Bob Engel, uh, <laughs> Rob Engel, sorry, and he said not to worry. The test, these 
stationarity tests are valid for this sort of models as well. That was his intuition, although he could not point us to the paper. Um, but essentially what we did was we just ran these tests as if they were valid, right? And, and what you find is no surprise at all uh, that we spectacularly, and when I say spectacularly, I mean spectacularly, fail these co-integration tests. Um, and the reason for that is that these models are so very hard to estimate and therefore they have to be simple. So what we have is a, a shared trend in economic growth for all countries. We essentially assume that all countries grow at the same, uh, uh, same rate. There is, there's this sort of country uh, dummy there that sort of like picks up differences in the average growth rate over the 70 year period but all deviations from that has to be shared between countries. And this was simply the uh, most complicated model uh, that we could get to uh, converge. Um, so that explains why we failed these non-stationarity tests. There's an error on this graph. Um, so this is for all countries together, average. Uh, in red, you're looking at the residuals the standard residuals and uh, then in green you're looking at the estimated uh, inefficiency average across countries uh, and then in blue uh, it's the two together now you don't need a co-integration test to say well those red that red line isn't really stationary richard um or that green line isn't really stationary you don't need a co-integrate or a stationarity test to uh, tell you this and recall that panel stationarity tests do not require that the average across countries is stationary, but rather they require that every country residuals are stationary. And then of course the problem gets much worse, and this is a thing best illustrated with the example of Japan and China for from the period 1950 to 1980, Japan grew like gangbusters and then the economy essentially stagnated for three, uh, three or four decades. China did the exact opposite, right? China was stagnant for a long time, then Deng Xiaoping came along, uh, reorganized the economy and now uh, uh, the, the economy of China is growing very rapidly and has so for decades. But our model essentially forces the same growth pattern on both India and China, right? Uh, sorry, Japan and China. Uh, so it's no surprise that we fail these non-stationary tests. And um, so what did we do against this? Well, two things. First, we recast the model as error correction, and we have a much better grip on the um, uh, on the econometrics, and we better understand our tests, uh, and we can estimate more complicated models. Um, and the other thing that we did was we split the sample in decades, so 1950 to 1959, 1960 to 1969, and so on and so forth. re the model on the decades, and then stationarity is gone, right? Because essentially it's a short panel, there's no issues about stationarity. And then we shrank the decadal estimates back to the sample average. Now, if non-stationarity would have influenced our parameter estimates for the whole sample, then the shrunk parameters would be different from the samples for the whole parent, uh, for the whole sample, right? Um, and here are the results. Um, so uh, these ones you have seen already. This is our base model, and then this is the same model but now split per decade and then uh, recombined to the sample as a whole. Um, in rats, you're looking at those coefficients that are statistically significantly different between the two procedures uh, and in orange uh, that is at the 10% interval. Uh, so what do we find? Well, the effect of capital and output per worker is different, but that's statistical, uh, a statistically significant difference. Economically, the difference is between 0.62 and 0.59. No, oh, it's not. It's not a parameter of interest in the first place, uh, and it's not something that I would particularly uh, uh, be concerned about. 
Uh, and then the other difference that we find is that poverty interacted with rainfall goes from insignificant positive to barely significant negative. Um, and yeah, there's a, uh, those two parameters are different at a 10% level, uh, but differences in insignificant parameters is not something that I uh, would normally be concerned about. Um, and then in the inefficiency term, and what we find is that the effect of rainfall has become somewhat stronger. But by and large, this suggests that even though we cannot, well, we can actually show that our model is not stationary, our error terms are not stationary, this does not seem to affect our parameter estimate. So uh, rest easy, not quite easy, uh, but uh, don't worry about this too much, I would say. Second thing that we did was recast the model as an error correction, um, where essentially uh, we still have per capita output with the log of that as our um, <clears throat> dependent variable that we now cast as a long-term uh, relationship with capital and climate. And then the change in growth, uh, oh no, the, the, the change in income growth um, is now a function of, again, the temperature and precipitation anomalies. But now we have this particular V term, this is an error correction uh, model. So this is essentially the residual of uh, this model here. So the assumption here is that you have a long-term equilibrium relationship between climate and uh, output that is invari uh, invariant over time. Um, and then every uh, so often you get kicked out of that equilibrium and that is because of weather shocks essentially. Uh, and then this parameter lambda tells you how fast once you have left the equilibrium, how fast you convert back to uh, the equilibrium relationship, right? So that's an error correction model. Um, <clears throat> we estimate this. Um, essentially what we find again is parabolic relationship with temperature. Uh, that is stronger in poor countries, so just as we had before. Um, what we now find is that there's actually also effects of rainfall, uh, which is different in rich countries uh, and in poor countries, uh, but uh, it does uh, show up. Previously, it was insignificant. This just strengthens our story. Um, in the short run, uh, so that is the second equation that we see here, uh, rainfall shocks uh, reduce growth in poor countries, just like we had before. Um, temperature shocks are not significant. Uh, importantly, the effect that I could not explain that we had a positive effect in rich countries now disappears. So it seems to be that this particular specification basically confirms qualitatively the story uh, that I just told with the error correction model makes it perhaps slightly more plausible. Um, so it seems to be that we have found something. So now to uh, round up, what we find uh, is climate effect of production potential of economies uh, and whether affects economic activity in the short run. Uh, and these effects are stronger in poor countries. Um, and this has three implications. Uh, one is um, an implication for climate policy, and that is that the Schelling conjecture holds uh, economic growth reduces vulnerability to climate change. Um, the second uh, implication is a methodological one. Um, that is that studies that regress income on climate should account for better induced heteroscedasticity. Essentially, what we say is that weather pops up in the error term. Um, now, if you've used a cross section or a short panel, there's actually a good chance that this weather induced heteroscedasticity, if you did not control for it, because it's also partly actually related to climate, um, has introduced a bias in your estimates. Um, so that is worrisome for that uh, particular literature. Um, also, studies that directly regress economic growth on weather shocks should account for lagged variables. Because if our specification is right, then a weather shock pushes you away from your potential, from your frontier. But then the year after, you just jump back to uh, the frontier. And 
those studies should have included a lag variable to account uh, for this particular uh, process. Now, I said should and should have, and that is because they didn't. So if our specification is right, then both the cross-section studies and the uh, weather studies unfortunately are all misspecified. So if our paper is wrong, then all the previously papers, previously published papers are wrong. Uh, no, sorry, if our paper is right, then all those papers are wrong. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Over to I haven't got a clock. I haven't got a clue what time it is. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Richard. We are uh, in time. Oh, perfect. So now uh, there is a, a moment for uh, questions. Uh, so uh, I asked for uh, to the participant if uh, they have uh, some questions. I know that uh, now there is a question from. Uh, I've seen, I've learned from your presentation that the, the weather variable at uh, the beginning was be because of the link, uh, uh, the linkage. Um, with energy, for instance, you mentioned that there can be a reason because of change in energy demand. Um, I wonder if it is possible that the the weather variable might effectively increase efficiency, uh, speculating on the link uh, linkage with the energy supply. Uh, for instance, uh, um, higher rainfall might imply higher production from uh, um, renewables, uh, from hydro, for instance. Uh, now, this is probably idiosyncratic and probably affects uneven the country. So, um, but nevertheless, it could be speculated in general, um, the, the, the change in weather-related variables might positively affect efficiency. Could that be the case? Well, in, in principle, you're, you're right that um, if you have an economy that relies on hydropower and you have unusually wet weather, then of course your electricity is uh, cheaper than normal. Uh, and that has a positive effect. Um, so in that sense, yeah, you can think of exceptions here. I think they are exceptions. Um, and of course, what we're looking at is not sectoral outputs or uh, price indices in a particular uh, in a particular sector of the economy. Um, I would find it hard to imagine that this would affect an entire economy. The only real exception that I can think of is Nepal, right, which is so dependent uh, in, in many many ways on hydropower exports to India. Is it Nepal or Bhutan? Um, <laughs> forgive me, forgive me uh, my ignorance here. Um, that, that, that this could dominate the, the total economy, but I don't think this is true elsewhere. It would be a I, minor thing. Perhaps in Brazil, but uh, I mean, apart from uh, Brazil, because uh, it's, uh, it's mostly uh, uh, hydro dominated uh, energy production but but apart from individual countries if i might add uh, it might be that in the future this uh, link will be more and more relevant not just on hydro but also on other uh, weather variables because if uh, the generation of uh, from renewables spread out uh, and and replaces effectively generation from hydrocarbons then possibly um, uh, weather uh, extreme weather events might induce uh, an increase in power generation. So this uh, might just be relevant for the future, not for now. That, that, that's, that's fair enough, but still electricity is a pretty small thing in most economies, right? And it will grow in the future relative to what it is today, but it will still not be big in the future. And I mentioned the fall of Bhutan um, because they're, it's essentially their only export, right? So in that economy, is it, it's big, but electricity isn't big in the Brazilian economy. So it, 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 it's not that, I mean, this is the tail, not the dog, right? Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Professor. Now I leave the floor uh, to uh, Professor Simone Borghesi from the University of uh, Siena.
Yes, here now it's yeah. green. Okay, yeah. can you hear me? Fine. Yeah. Hi, Richard. And Hi. thank you for the presentation. Um, very interesting, uh, huge effort to to link to to literature, uh, climate, and weather. I have uh, just a matter of curiosity because I'm not that much into this literature, but uh, I noticed that your um, frontier function is uh, a quadratic, is assumed to be quadratic in T, right? Now, I was wondering, is there a possibility that uh, the function could be, say, cubic or some other uh, functional form that was not taken into account? In other words, you assume it to be quadratic if I got it right, but you know, it could be, have a different form. So I was wondering whether the semi-parametric or a non-parametric approach could be developed in this literature in the future. Just to uh, let you understand what I have in mind, I was thinking of something like the environmental consciousness curve literature, something that I didn't know pretty well, that started out assuming a quadratic function and then it turned out not to be quadratic. That was a imposing somehow the functional form. And so by moving to uh, non-parameter or semi-parameter techniques, uh, things turn out to be different. So what's your opinion about this? No, uh, that, that's, that's a fair point. Uh, well, we did try a linear and a cubic specification. The quadratic one is the best among the three that we tested, which of course doesn't mean that the quadratic one is the right one. Um, the uh, conventional approach in this particular literature is to assume to use bins to say temperature below five degrees between five and ten, ten and fifteen, uh, and use that, and then essentially you have a flexible functional form. Um, the reason that we shied away from this is again, these models are very hard to estimate. And for every additional parameter that you introduce, and of course we always call things non-parametric, but it just means that the parameters are hidden at a different layer, right? It's not that we lose parameters. Yes, we typically add parameters. And um, that just makes it very hard to estimate more nonlinear relationships. So that's why we didn't go there, but it, it's a valid, uh, valid suggestion. Okay, great. Thank you for your answer. Okay, thank you. If you want, if you can also. <laughs> you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, Perfect. thank you. Thank you for your seminar. I have uh, a couple of uh, naive questions. Uh, I think the, the, the first one is, uh, so basically the, the, you make a, um, an identification assumption that the level of uh, per capita uh, um, product depends on climate, whether the inefficiency depends on the uh, uh, differences between the, the actual temperature and, and the uh, moving average. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, it is not completely clear to me why you don't take these differences in the frontier as well. Uh, I mean, because uh, the, 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 your dependent variable is the current uh, output per worker. So it might well depend on, on, on the current uh, difference from the uh, average temperature as well. Um, and my yeah. second question, because it is, it is very much okay. related, it, uh, if uh, uh, non-stationarity is an issue, could you work with just uh, uh, growth rates? Okay, um, let, let me answer your questions uh, in the order that you ask them. Um, um, so what we have is that 
the average temperature affects per capita output, right? And then you said, yeah, 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 but uh, the weather anomaly also affects, could also affect the output. Exactly, yeah. And, but it does, right? Because we are subtracting this U term. You know, clearly it, it does, but it, 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 large, and your sigma is large, and therefore your expected inefficiency is large. So the temperature anomaly also affects the output in that particular year. No, no, the, I mean, it clearly does, but uh, the point is that you are imputing this uh, effect to inefficiency by functional form, basically. So what you're saying is that we should have... So does it anything prevent you to have the same differences in the mean instead of the in all only in the inefficiency term? So what we could do, um, we, we've run so many models, I'm not sure that we have done this. Uh, we could drop the U term and just stick the lambdas in here directly, right? That is definitely something that can be done. I'm not sure that we have done it. Uh, what you can't do, and this is a Hackman argument, that you have your temperature anomalies here and here, because then yeah, sure. everything goes out of the window, right? And uh, nothing converges anymore. Uh, so okay. we could test this particular specification against specification where we have the weather anomalies directly in the frontier. Yes. That is definitely something that is feasible. I can't recall whether we've done that, yes or no. Um, we may have. Yeah. We've run a million uh, versions. Your second question was about non stationarity, and then the question was can you get rid of the non stationarity by taking the first difference here? Um, yes, you could. Um, and then your concerns about non stationarity are ameliorated, right? They do not necessarily disappear, but uh, they're much less of a worry. Uh, the reason we did not do this, and this is something that I did not say, um, is that there is this paper by Newell, Preston, Sexton that shows that really the empirical evidence is that weather affects the level of economic activity rather than its growth rate. Uh, so what they did in this particular paper is a cross-validation uh, study. Uh, so they estimated 400 alternative specifications and then leave one out, leave a country out, leave a decade out, uh, that sort of stuff. I found, yeah, those those specifications that put the effect of weather in the growth rate are just not supported by the data and we should really affect and we should really put it in the level. That's That's why we specify the model uh, like we did. Uh, but that's something that I skipped uh, uh, trying to uh, stay on time. But it's it's a valid point if you do not know this particular paper. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, um, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, actually, I have a couple of questions and then we check uh, if uh, this is too much. Uh, I start with the first. Uh, uh, thank you, first of all, because of your uh, very, very interesting presentation. I was astonished by the result uh, where the different politics uh, has, have an impact uh, which is totally negligible with respect to the one of different climate condition of countries. Um, my question is, uh, uh, is it possible to think to extend this kind of uh, um, estimation models to kind of uh, understand or forecast what is going to happen in the future? I mean, uh, this is a very strong, uh, impressive result analysis, uh, which uh, focuses on uh, what has happened in the past, but uh, uh, our general concern about climate changes, about what is going to happen in the future. but. Uh, uh, do, do you think it is possible to extend the, the approach also to see what is going to happen uh, if uh, the climate change is going to change the climate of England or Italy or whatever? Uh, 
Oh, uh, the the answer is obviously yes. We have estimated the model, and you can use the model to extrapolate. Uh, the mm -hmm. reason that I did not present this um, is because I thought it was I, I had less than an hour, and I thought it was more important to take you through the okay. econometrics and application. And of course, the results are dependent on the country because different countries are different, and then there's a million climate change scenarios, right? Um, so, yes, it's possible, but you generate between 160 countries and five different climate scenarios and five different uh, economic scenarios, you can just create an enormous amount of output. Uh, so, taking you through our projections for climate change would have taken 10 minutes or more. Um, so, that is why I did not include it. Apologies. Um, the, I can give you the summary. Uh, and that is that our impacts are a good bit larger than the impact of climate change that you may have seen by Bill Nordhaus, uh, also a good bit larger than the empirical estimates that you may have seen by Melissa Dell, uh, but at the same time they're a good bit smaller than the empirical estimates by Marshall Burke, they're sort of somewhere in between, uh, but they, they're the Sort of a ballpark hit that the, the world economy would take at the end of the century is in the order of a negative 10%. Huh. Okay, thank you. If I have room, I would try to uh, ask you a second point. Um, I, let me advance that uh, uh, as a premise. I'm not a, an econometrician, so I not familiar with uh, the, the, the the weaknesses of the approach. Uh, you discussed about them uh, a lot, uh, and I understand that uh, they make uh, make an issue. Uh, the model you presented, in a sense, uh, confirms that uh, countries that uh, are hot are also poor. And so, once this uh, conclusion is uh, kind of uh, established. I was not able, how can you conclude that uh, uh, sensitivity to weather condition or inefficiency really depend more from climate than uh, from the economic strength of a country? Um, yeah, I, I, I perhaps should have gone slower through that part. Uh, if you compare the impact estimates of the effects of climate on output, they weaken for richer countries. Yeah. And also the effect of weather shocks are weaker for richer countries. Exactly. So it's not that the sensitivity to weather and climate disappears, but it becomes weaker. And that makes perfect sense, right? As we move out of agriculture and into offices, uh, then we are less weather dependent. Not independent of weather, but less weather dependent than uh, than our farming forefathers and foremothers used to be, right? Mm. Uh, okay, I, but because I think, for, for example, two cases where the weather condition have, was in principle like a disaster, you know, for example, I think to Arizona or to uh, Nevada, which are the, those country in the US, uh, uh, that uh, before getting Las Vegas, uh, it was a completely desertic uh, situation. And, and so I see kind of a counter example in those cases where uh, a, a, a large investment uh, in structure and uh, kind of smart thinking about uh, po possible economic uh, use of the land and, and the situation made those country uh, kind of uh, advanced uh, and uh, wealthy. And now I suppose that uh, their, uh, let's say, sensitivity to weather conditions are much smaller and even negligible uh, compared to similar uh, other country with the same uh, weather condition. So uh, it, it's possible that uh, this dependency changes a lot uh, after that the investment and the economic growth has been established in some region or in some countries. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right uh, there. Um, in the empirical specification that we see here, everything is swept up by a time trend and 
by economic growth, essentially. But of course, there's independently of that, there's also technological change. Uh, yeah. And the invention of air conditioning, of course, allowed the economic development of the southern half of the United States, right? Uh, it has not yet fully penetrated poorer countries. That is actually now going on. Um, so there, there is a wealth effect as well, right? Air conditioning used to be very expensive. Uh, it's much more expensive than it is now. And what we now see is, is a rapid penetration of air conditioning into China, uh, in the southern half of China, uh, as well as into the middle classes of India, right? So uh, this will change in the future. And, and that is another reason, and that was your first question, of course, can we use this to project to climate change? Well, <laughs> We capture the economic growth effects in our model, but we do not separately capture uh, the technological change effects in our model, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that means that you would take these projections with a grain of salt. I'm not so much worried because we have a time trend to get through it all. I'm not so much worried about uh, the effect in sample, but out of sample. You may well be right that our relationship is not, not stable. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, now there is also uh, another question that uh, we write to your chat. Uh, Great work, plenty of interesting ideas. There's a growing literature linking climate change and trade. Is it's clear that trade is affected by climate change and possibly vice versa? How trade openness and trade relationships are likely to matter for results presented in this paper? Um, LTS charged, right? Um, so essentially the assumption here is that countries are independent of each other. And of course they are not. And one of the linkages, as you rightly point out, is international trade. Uh, and it may well be that a bad harvest in one country uh, affects the agricultural markets in other countries, right? And we completely ignore that. Um, and of course what we've seen I think it was seven or eight years ago now, where there were major floods along the Mekong uh, River, and then companies discovered that crucial bits in their manufacturing were actually made in Vietnam, and they never realized that now those factories were on the water. And we saw factories stop in Japan because of the Mekong floods, and we saw factories stop in the UK and in Italy and everywhere because of floods in the Mekong. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right that essentially the assumption here is that all countries are fully autarkic, right? Which is a slightly ridiculous assumption. Um, really what you would want to do is re-estimate the model, but now with spatial dependence. Um, that would be uh, three or four years of work for a very clever PhD to get that sorted. That's beyond me, I'm afraid. Okay, perfect. So I think we uh, am looking at the, if there are other uh, questions. Yes, there is another one uh, again on your chat. This, I wanted to confirm there's no Sender, I wanted to confirm that I understood correctly the stationarity issues enter in your model only when climate is integrated into the production frontier. Yes, that, that is correct. The issues are in the frontier, right? So on the left-hand side, we have per capita output, essentially per capita income. No, so that is non-stationary. Um, and on the right hand side, we have temperature, which is going up, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be concerned about global warming. Uh, so, yes, that is where our main concerns about stationarity lie or non stationarity lie, rather. Okay, I'm checking, uh, I'm checking if there are other questions. Uh, uh, no, perfect. So, you have, we have a, a perfect in time. So, I would like to uh, uh, thank you very much, Richard, because of your seminar was very interesting, very, very clear. I have to see that also the, 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 the difference with respect to uh, weather and climate and how to, to manage this is uh, in, in our uh, research. And so the effect on the um, output, so in the production.
And uh, now uh, I would, would like to, to thank you everybody for, for being here. I remember also the next uh, uh, seminar which will be with uh, um, Dick Bergman from uh, Yale University. The next will be 8th of uh, February. Again, I would like to thank you, uh, Professor Toll, and uh, thank you and, and keep in touch. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Me. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. You too. Thank you.